Hi everyone, uh, and welcome uh, to a re-recording of our webinar on contextualizing the natural diamond industry headwinds with data. We did a live version of this webinar earlier this week uh, with uh, the Bharat Diamond Bourse, but there were some technical glitches uh, in the recording and uh, upon popular request, that one was in Gujarati. Um, so this time we decided we'll do a re-recording, hopefully without any uh, technical glitches, and also we'll do it in English uh, so that we can uh, reach a wider audience. And just to set the stage for what we're going to be covering in this webinar, uh, I, th I think there's a lot of negativity uh, in the natural diamond industries, particularly right now, uh, surrounding a lot of uh, opinions people have uh, about uh, the industry. Maybe some would argue that there's um, a strong lack of demand. Uh, some would argue maybe the lab grown is cannibalizing the industry. There's a lot of opinions people have. And because of that, there's a lot of negativity uh, in the industry right now. Uh, and hopefully what we'll be able to show is that not a lot of that negativity is grounded in data. Uh, surely uh, some parts of the industry are doing very badly. Uh, but also, by and large, uh, we, we see that uh, you know, a lot of that negativity is uh, perhaps a bit exaggerated. Uh, so uh, hopefully you'll be able to be the judge of that yourself uh, as you see some of the data that we'll be presenting uh, in this webinar. Uh, now, before I go into that, I'll give a brief introduction about us. So we're part of the Lemon Consultant Group. Uh, we're a leading global uh, consulting and technology group. So we have a lot of software solutions uh, across the board and consulting services, uh, particularly for the gems and jewelry industry. Uh, we're a five-time winner of the Most Innovative Company Award by GJPC also. Um, and, you know, our clients include everyone from uh, across the supply chain, from miners to retailers. So uh, within that, particularly uh, Diatech uh, is our new initiative of uh, empowering the industry professionals with artificial intelligence. Uh, so this includes several services like uh, AI-based demand generation, real-time analytics on pricing, planning, movement and supply heat maps. Um, uh, and essentially, the, the goal of all of this is to help you make more informed decisions. Uh, uh, with that, you be ideally be able to also boost sales. Uh, so some uh, special things, for example, include that you can have a personalized white labeled storefront. Uh, so if you don't have a website to sell or show uh, your goods to customers, uh, we'll be able to set it up for you within minutes uh, and it'll be completely white labeled with your own branding, um, but you'll be able to get up and running quickly uh, to digitize your business. So that is just one of the many things uh, that we're doing with uh, Diatech uh, AI. So it is a free app uh, for a lot of these things. Uh, you can download it from the Android or the iOS app store, or you could just go to diatech.ai online um, and click on analytics or marketplace uh, to explore uh, some of the sol solutions that we provide. Okay, uh, hopefully uh, this sets the stage for who we are. Uh, now let's jump in into the core uh, of the webinar. So, uh, like I mentioned before, people have uh, various notions of uh, why the industry is not doing very well right now or why it's a difficult period for the industry. Um, and the, so there's different aspects that we need to answer or show data for um, to hopefully uh, cover a lot of the, the notions that people have. Okay, so the first part of that is uh, the demand story. You know, a lot of people would argue uh, that demand is extremely sluggish right now and that is a huge cause for concern. Uh, a lot of people worry that it may be permanent. So the first question uh, that we need to ask and we need to answer hopefully with data is that has jewelry demand actually decreased? And if so, by how much? And is this a permanent decrease uh, that the industry will have to adapt to? So let's look at the data on the real U.S. jewelry consumption. So this is adjusted for inflation, and this is uh, we're looking at a period from 2017 to 2023. Uh, now, if you look at the chart, and so this is an overall chart. It shows jewelry consumption, including non-diamond jewelry and natural and lab-grown. So it is an overall picture of the industry. Uh, but I think it's important to answer how the jewelry industry is doing as a whole before we kind of drill down into natural diamond industry specifically. Okay, so uh, looking at the data, we can see that compared to 2017, 2018, 2019, these pre-pandemic years, 
we are today significantly higher uh, in the uh, jewelry consumption uh, data. Uh, you know, uh, we looking at the annualized growth rate and the trajectory at which this was going, we are more or less uh, where we would need to be or a bit higher than that even. Uh, compared to the March peak, uh, March 2022 peak. And so this is, you know, where uh, the Russian war intensified. And this is where, you know, uh, colloquially everything seemed to have come crashing down. And since then, uh, we do see a decline in, in consumption. But if you see by and large, compared to pre-pandemic levels, uh, U.S. jewelry consumption in real dollar terms is at least up 12%. Um, and compared to that peak in March 2022, there is a 7 to 8% decline uh, in the value of jewelry consumed. So the natural question that you might have is, okay, fine, looking at the data, what is a good benchmark? You know, uh, should we consider March 2022 as the benchmark to compare, oh, we're in a terrible period today because, uh, you know, consumption is down 8%, or uh, should we consider uh, the pre-pandemic years, so 2017, 2018, 2019, that as the benchmark? Because if we look at that as the benchmark, then it seems like we're doing fine, or the overall consumption, the overall industry is doing fine. So it is worth noting that out of this, this chart, the real value, the real uh, consumption since March declined by around 7 to 8%. But in nominal terms, so without adjusting for inflation, uh, the consumption has only declined by about 3%. So again, this is the industry as a whole. Uh, we will see that some segments are more badly hit. But if you look at the nominal uh, U.S. jewelry consumption, that decline after March is, is way less pronounced. It's, it's very subtle. It's a small decline. And again, compared to the pre-pandemic levels, we're still significantly higher. So whenever we look at this chart, uh, this is my favorite chart. Uh, and again, this is normalized uh, to give a better uh, sense of the correlation. But whenever uh, you know, we discuss, oh, the U.S. jewelry consumption is significantly up after the pandemic, uh, you know, it released a lot of pent up demand. There is, is a, 2021 was a blockbuster year for uh, natural diamond jewelry consumption or jewelry consumption as a whole. Um, I show people this chart and this is a chart showing the U.S money supply against the U.S. jewelry consumption, again, in nominal terms. And so if you see, uh, you know, after the pandemic and uh, the slowdown and the overall sentiment in the U.S., uh, the government pumped in a lot of money. Uh, and as much money that they pumped in, a lot of it went into uh, a direct increase in the U.S. jewelry consumption. Uh, and there's various reasons, uh, you know, uh, trickle down economics or whatever, but uh, that increase that increased consumption dramatically after the pandemic and that was the cause for increase sure pent-up demand might have been one aspect of that increase uh, but by and large the all the increase in consumption or most of the consumption increase can be attributed to an increase in money supply so when after march the the uh, real uh, dollar value of that consumption decreased by about seven to eight percent that was just inflation catching up so, uh, you know, if, if you look at the inflation now, which is so the CPI, the consumer price index is uh, one way to measure inflation. Uh, and if you look at that uh, chart uh, over the same uh, time horizon, you see that inflation generally lags by about six to eight months uh, after the money supply increases. So the money supply had started increasing around this time, but the inflation was lagging by six to eight months and it really only caught up or it really only increased dramatically um, uh, close to that March 2022 peak. And so as inflation increased, we saw uh, an overall seven to eight percent decline in that real uh, jewelry consumption statistic. Okay, so by the way, uh, we're showing you a lot of these indicators, but uh, on the app or on analytics.diatech.ai, you'll be able to play around with uh, all of these indicators yourself and see uh, uh, how different things, different uh, attributes about the industry and the economy correlate with each other. So it includes things like rough production or inflation uh, or jewelry consumption or import indexes or all, 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 of, uh, all of that stuff. Okay, so that was just a, a side note uh, as we're, we're talking about a lot of these charts over and over again. Okay, so 
Surely there, there, there have been inflationary pressures and high interest rates since then to curb the inflation, um, which uh, have affected the consumer's propensity to spend versus save. You know, uh, when uh, prices are increasing very quickly uh, and interest rates are high, you're less likely to use debt. You're more likely to save more or invest more. Uh, and so that has affected the consumer mindset a bit. And so, uh, you know, I'm not saying that all of that decline has been just uh, because of inflation. Obviously, there's been a 3% decline, even in nominal terms. Um, but relatively, those effects are weak. Uh, you know, com more or less, the, that decline has just been inflation uh, really catching up uh, in that 7 to 8% decline. So if you look at the overall, uh, you know, outlooks and uh, kind of the, this is a report recently by Bain, uh, if you see that, in, especially in uh, upper and middle class households, uh, the intention to spend has decreased between 2022 and 2023 August. Uh, the intent to save uh, has by and large increased slightly and the intent to use debt has decreased dramatically. Uh, so even the overall outlook is now positive, uh, especially compared to last year. Uh, you know, un unemployment has been lower. The industry has been doing well overall. Uh, and as the U.S. economy is talking about sort of a soft landing. So the overall outlook might have improved, but uh, kind of emotionally, people are less likely to use them. So I'm saying, of course, uh, since then, uh, since that, that peak, a lot has changed economically as well. Uh, but overall, that effect has been lower. Kind of the big reason why we saw that peak in March 2022 was a very high money supply in the first place, right? So realistically, that March 2022 period was a terrible benchmark. It was a transient period. It was a temporary period by design because it had a high money supply and low inflation due to a systemic lag. So people had more money to spend and things weren't as expensive yet. Uh, and so the inflation, when it caught up, we saw a subsequent decline in consumption. So overall, that March 2022 period was an anomaly. It was an exception and not the norm. Uh, the other conclusion that we can gather from this data is that economic uncertainties have affected consumption over the last year, but demand is still strong compared to the pre-pandemic level. So when we're looking at 2017, 18, 19, those years and comparing demand right now, uh, it's still strong uh, compared to those years. And we're saying in real dollar terms, it's up uh, around 12%. So, okay, so the overall industry is doing fine. What about the big jewelers? How are they performing? So if you look at any of the big retailers, you know, be it Signet or Richmond or Cha Tai Fook, uh, by and large, their revenues are up compared to pre-pandemic levels. Again, in the last year or so, uh, compared to, you know, 2022, some of them might be down. So Signet, you know, we see a, a, a sh small decline uh, from uh, year on year. But by and large, if you look at the history, uh, you know, this is still a good year. Um, now, again, this is overall uh, consumption, overall revenue. Uh, so uh, it is possible that some of that increase or some of that overall uh, strength has been driven by non-diamond or labrador diamond jewelry. Uh, so especially in China, uh, it seems that gold uh, jewelry, so the, again, non-diamond jewelry by and large has picked up uh, and that has carried the jewelry industry more so uh, than diamond industry. So there, there's some evidence for that. But if you, if you look overall, the retailers are doing fine. And that, that in a sense, should be uh, some sign of strength in the industry. Uh, the consumers are still spending on jewelry, uh, whether or not it's, uh, it's diamond or non-diamond. Uh, and overall, that, that's good. Uh, that's good for the industry in the long run. So, okay, we talked a lot about jewelry consumption overall. We talked a lot about uh, the U.S. jewelry market and the, the retailers and how they have, uh, have uh, kind of uh, compared uh, overall in the last few years. But then the next uh, natural question that people would ask is, yeah, maybe jewelry overall is doing fine. Gold is doing fine. Gold prices have increased. People are, you know, going to gold. Maybe lab-grown diamonds are doing very well. Lab-grown diamond jewelry has uh, pulled the industry up. Natural diamond industry, we're doomed. We're doing very bad. Um, and so the, the natural question then is like, has natural diamond jewelry demand decreased? Um, so let's let's look at some data to assess consumer behavior, right? Uh, if, you, if you just look at this chart, uh, yes, lab-grown diamond kind of uh, traffic, search traffic has dramatically increased 
since 2017. And, you know, there, there's been an exponential increase in the last few years. Uh, as more and more people uh, are searching for, uh, for Labyrinth Diamonds. But as that has happened, there's also been way more people searching for real diamonds. And that, that overall search traffic for real diamonds is still way more uh, compared to uh, Labyrinth Diamonds. Secondly, while more people are searching for lab-grown diamonds because of curiosity, it does not come at the expense of um, natural diamond uh, searches. So if you look at, you know, for the last 20 years, um, the search traffic for natural diamonds has been relatively stable and consistent, and if anything, uh, you know, has increased slightly in the last few years. So I think when we say cannibalization, it's a very strong word. Uh, there is a lot of interest in lab grown diamonds, uh, but if you look at the search traffic and if, whether that search traffic is coming uh, away from natural diamonds or real diamonds, it, it does not seem to be the case. Okay, uh, and if you look at you know the top searches, very few people are actively searching uh, for lab grown diamonds directly. Uh, most of the top searches are all generic, uh, so you know people care about what's uh, they're looking for oval diamond engagement rings or halo diamond engagement rings. They're looking for generic searches more often. Very few searches are lab diamond specific. Uh, and so that, that shows you something, right? People are not actively like, okay, I only want to buy a lab diamond. Um, I think uh, it, it hasn't come to that point uh, just quite yet. Uh, there are people who, are, who search for lab diamonds because they're cheaper, but by and large people are not, uh, have not permanently shifted and that, that they're, they're not completely, uh, they've not completely changed their ideologies or spending preferences just yet. You know, in fact, what people do care about a lot is what's Jennifer Lawrence wearing or what's Margot Robbie wearing. People care about what others are wearing, especially celebrities. Uh, and so as, uh, uh, you know, uh, we look at this, we, the natural conclusion is that lab grown or natural is largely a branding play. Uh, and maybe in the short run with sustainability claims, etc., cetera, uh, lab grown has capitalized in the short run. But continued branding and differentiation is certainly an ongoing requirement in any industry, not just the diamond industry. And we are working towards that. So, you know, we, you might have heard recently about De Beers uh, kind of uh, resuming its Diamond is Forever campaign, uh, the National Diamond Council uh, and the partnership with manufacturers, and they're onboarding more uh, manufacturers of plate. Uh, they, they're working constantly towards that branding of natural diamonds and kind of distinguishing the story uh, from lab grown diamonds. Uh, there's a lot of other councils, associations, people invested uh, in uh, making natural diamond stories stand out. And so they, they'll advertise about celebrities wearing uh, natural diamond rings or, you know, th there's a lot of people who have a vested interest in protecting the industry. And so there is uh, an overall effort on branding uh, natural diamonds. But it, it is going to be important. I, I, th I think that the takeaway is that uh, it's, it's a right step and we need to continue uh, on that path because that's what people really care about at the end of the day. Uh, yeah, that, that's how people's opinions are formed or shaped. So, you know, especially if you look at the statistic, 80% uh, of all jewelry sales is branded uh, jewelry, uh, especially in, in the diamond jewelry space. Uh, and branding is key. And so, you know, there's no uh, kind of uh, two thoughts about that, uh, especially uh, as the industry strives to differentiate between lab grown and natural, which is going to be critical. Branding is key for both sides to uh, kind of develop their target audiences and shape that niche uh, that they have. So what about sales? You know, we're looking at, first of all, uh, lab grown diamonds, the value that they would have in regard in kind of comparison in comparison to natural diamonds. Uh, we wouldn't see uh, an increase in overall consumption compared to pre-pandemic levels if lab-grown diamonds had significantly cannibalized the natural space. Uh, the, the numbers will simply not add up. Uh, if 50% of the unit sales lab-grown is now captured, if those 50% has eaten away from previously natural diamond share, that would simply not work because then we would see the overall consumption tank uh, and not increase by 12%. So those numbers just don't add up. Um, but even if it increased the market, if you look at the data, uh, you know, we do know unequivocally that uh, the lab-grown value market share is currently around 23%. Uh, 
Uh, okay, so this is a simulation that I ran uh, with some numbers that we know uh, from uh, kind of industry data. So compared to 2017, 2020, where we had around two to six percent of uh, market share for lab grown, currently it is uh, you know close to 23 percent. So it has increased dramatically. And then I've imputed some uh, average prices uh, for lab grown diamonds and natural diamonds. Uh, rings because uh, th those are the average article that we're looking at and there's other costs associated with that um, and if you look at that the overall u.s jewelry consumption uh figures are as below as the you know we, we something we uh covered earlier so this is the real u.s jewelry consumption and if you look at the total units sold uh, with regards to that, so we're assuming that uh, kind of the average natural diamond ring or the average lab grown diamond ring uh, is the, the representative article. Uh, and so the, this is the unit uh, in which we can count the overall number of units sold. Overall, the total units have increased from around 16 million units in 2017 to 22 million units in 2023 when we consider both uh, natural and lab grown. And if we look at natural units sold specifically, it's still up from around 15.5 million to 16 million. So yes, compared to 2021, 2022, where it was all the way up to 17.5, we have seen a decline. We are uh, you know, lower than that, uh, maybe uh, a bit too much. But by and large, we're still slightly up and we don't expect a, an industry as mature as natural diamond industry is not going to see double digit growth uh, year on year, especially uh, in, in, a, in a period where we have seen a lot of economic uncertainty. So given the circumstances, given the overall economic landscape, in compared to pre-pandemic levels, we are seeing a 3% increase in the number of units sold even within natural diamonds. And if we just run the simulation, we don't get to a lab grown diamond unit market share at the end of the day uh, to more than 28%. So that 50% number is a bit exaggerated. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll get to that in a little bit. But even without all of that, even if you just look at the value market share uh, numbers, which we know more or less are factual, uh, and we compare the overall uh, kind of uh, overall jewelry consumption to, to get an estimate of how much the value sales have increased compared to pre-pandemic levels, the natural diamond value compared to pre-pandemic levels has increased 12%. So that 12% increase that we're seeing in overall U.S. jewelry consumption, we also see a 12% increase in the natural diamond value sales uh, over the same period. So that should hopefully give you some sense of, uh, you know, the, the, the consumption year on year is still higher. Yes, compared to 2022 levels where it was 37% higher than pre-pandemic levels, now we're just 12% higher. So th that decline has been dramatic compared to 2022. But we've already established uh, that that was a terrible benchmark. Uh, if you look at uh, the money supply and inflation, that was just artificially uh, increased consumption. It was not sustainable to begin with. Uh, you, if, if you don't expect natural diamond consumption to increase 40% in three years. That is not something realistic. Uh, and so that was an anomaly, uh, not the norm. Okay. so. Really, there's several things, first of all, that I think are wrong with that 50% unit sales number. I think uh, it's a widely misunderstood statistic. Firstly, uh, it does not include any of the online retailers uh, it, it's, uh, or big box retailers. It's, it's, that number is derived from a subset of independent jewelers in the U.S., so it is by all measures an estimate and a skewed estimate because it's not uh, kind of a balanced sample. And uh, we know that a lot of the sales in percentage terms, about 25% were online uh, sales uh, and a lot more were with the big box retailers. And so this number uh, is, is slightly misleading, firstly, because of that. Secondly, uh, even if uh, that were not the case, uh, this number is about loose uh, jewelry, uh, loose uh, diamond uh, sales, uh, not uh, kind of finished pieces. And so again, that unit sales number is uh, slightly skewed. Um, and this is a cause for a lot of pessimism because I see everyone quoting this 50% number as the doomsday statistic for the natural diamond industry, but it's not in a lot of ways, uh, you know, just to give uh, just to put this in context, so India, who is the world's largest uh, diamond, uh, polished diamond exporter, 
Um, India's cut and polished natural diamond exports in 2022-23 were $22 billion, whereas its lab-grown diamond exports were not even $1.8 billion. Uh, again, this was 22-23. Uh, it might have increased slightly since then. But just to, just to give you the, the breadth, the gap between the natural diamond and lab-grown diamond, especially in the wholesale space, uh, this should ideally put things into context. Okay, so I think as the lab grown diamond market share increases, yes, it is accounting for more share of units. And uh, one day, maybe it'll also reach that 50% if it hasn't already. So I do think, you know, that is a foreseeable future. It is going to happen one day. But that's, it, it's, it, it's pointless to argue whether or not that is the case because it is also growing the market. You know, it has increased the market by 45% in terms of the number of units compared to 2017 that increase could never have been achieved by, lab, uh, by natural diamonds alone. So it's, it, by saying that it's cannibalizing the industry, you're saying, no, if lab-grown diamonds were not there, the natural diamond industry would have, would have gotten all of these additional 45% uh, of the units that are sold, uh, which is, uh, you know, it's not realistic. I think, by and large, it's creating new demand. Uh, and if it's creating new demand, if it's, it's selling, you know, uh, millions of pieces more, uh, it's because it's, it's cheaper and so more accessible by more people. And I think that accessibility is, is, the, real, uh, is the real story behind lab grown diamonds. Um, I think if you look overall, uh, the top 2% of the population accounts for about 40% of luxury spending. So uh, I think a lot of you will agree that there is a clear story and appeal for H&I's uh, high net worth individuals to buy natural diamonds. I think you know, they'll buy natural diamonds maybe for the same reasons that they buy original paintings. Uh, I think you could get very high quality replicas uh, for way cheaper. And yet people go and buy uh, a natural uh, a, a, a real painting uh, because there is some you know, uh, feeling associated with uh, something, something that's original or natural, so to speak. Uh, and at the end of the day, even those paintings just have a certificate of authenticity that you can verify. And that, that's a similar case with the natural diamonds. So I think by and large, uh, you know, that, that story, that appeal, for H&I's, for luxury spend has not changed. As they keep getting richer, as the top 2% of the world keeps getting richer, uh, I think uh, the overall demand for luxury products and for that, that story will uh, keep on uh, increasing. You know, and the declining lab-grown diamond prices will only strengthen this perception. So as lab-grown diamonds get cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, um, that gap between it being an accessibility product versus natural diamonds being a luxury product will only widen. So that is one thing. Uh, and then the second more important thing is that despite higher margins, jewelers and retailers will have to sell three to four times as many units to maintain similar income with lab grown diamonds. Now, it is true that in the past, uh, jewelers and retailers have enjoyed much higher margins on lab grown diamonds, and so they've been able to afford uh, selling more and more and more lab grown diamonds. But with competition from the Walmarts and the Costco's and uh, the online retailers who are willing to undercut their competition significantly, uh, lab grown diamonds will just not be uh, sustaining those high margins as they, they have in the past. So in the long run, jewelers will really have to sell three to four times as many units uh, to kind of uh, maintain the income that they used to take home uh, with natural diamonds. And that for in the long run is not sustainable for most retailers. Uh, if you look at the, the data, overall 47% of all jewelry by value is bridal. That target market is relatively finite. Just because things get cheaper, uh, just because you know you might get give free diamonds with the gold, uh, free lab grown diamonds if you buy this ring, the, it's the only cost is the gold. That is not going to dramatically change the marriage rates. People are not going to marry more just because the engagement rings are cheaper. So this the size of this market is relatively finite. It's it's inelastic. The demand is inelastic to price, relatively speaking. And so if that market is finite, jewelers and retailers have a very strong incentive to resist lab-grown diamonds, especially for bridal. 
It's a limited market. Uh, the prices are continuously falling. There's going to be shrinking margins with competitions from the wholesalers like Walmart. Uh, and so there's going to be less value for everyone throughout the supply chain. Instead, you know, 47% of all jewelry is bridal, but 46% is also fashion. That is something that Lagron has huge potential in. You know, in the long run, with fashion, Lagron has so many more applications. You know, be it accessories, be it entire costumes studded with Lagron diamonds, be it props. The opportunity is endless. So I think ultimately with there's going to be more product differentiation possible in fashion where people can brand different designs differently and as you know big fashion houses have in the past uh, and more importantly fashion is going to be able to absorb the high volume of lab grown diamonds at lower prices and still make it feasible because in the long run selling single single stones um, at, at you know, $200, $300 per carat at the wholesale level. Uh, and even at the retail level, it's going to uh, keep coming down. Single stones are not going to have enough value to uh, cover the overheads for everyone throughout the supply chain. So at the end of the day, a fashion segment, which will be able to absorb way higher volumes, may be the perfect fit for lab-grown diamonds in the long run. For both the lab-grown and natural industry, I think uh, you know, uh, the lab-grown industry itself will not be able to survive with the finite and limited market that the bridal jewelry has today. So I think the, 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 some things that we can take away from this data is firstly, uh, you know, we looked at search traffic, we looked at sales numbers, we looked at a lot of uh, different data forms and there's just less evidence that suggests cannibalization. Because cannibalization by definition means that, you know, we're taking consumers who were previously natural diamond consumers and shifting them to lab growth. That might have happened to some extent. We cannot deny that. Uh, and in certain segments, it has happened more so also. So we'll see uh, more about that in detail. Um, but by and large, uh, if you look at the overall statistics, lab grown is creating new demand and it's possibly appealing to a different audience. It's a different story. Uh, and so there's just overall less evidence for cannibalization. We also learned that continued branding and differentiation will be a requirement for long-term growth, but that's just not just for the diamond industry, but you know, all businesses need to focus on branding and differentiation. In the long run, that is the true uh, you know, requirement for growth. Uh, and as lab grown prices will fall further, they're likely to capture more of fashion because the market can expand much further and the demand is uh, less finite, uh, I should say. Uh, overall, again, a lot of people will agree to this, is that the natural diamond story and its appeal to HNIs, uh, who account for most of the luxury spend, uh, that, that appeal and that story is strong. And retailers and jewelers have a vested interest to preserve natural diamonds, to maintain their profitability, to maintain their revenue and uh, profits. Okay, So overall, the, the, those are some uh, general takeaways that we have about the demand. And this was the whole demand story. I think the next aspect that a lot of people are concerned with is maybe demand is strong, maybe demand is not that strongly affected. Uh, but natural diamond prices have fallen by as much as 40% since March 2022. You know, we have a Diatech diamond index. Uh, compared to that March 2022 peak, our natural diamond price index shows a net drop of almost 35%. And even compared to 2017 levels, it's 8% below that. So what went wrong? You know, we're seeing that demand has not that strongly affected. How have prices decreased and slashed so dramatically? So the truth is that while prices peaked in March 2022, B2B diamond inventory continued to increase through the rest of the year. Uh, you know, so in value terms, the overall inventory grew by over 20% through the course of the year. And in one to four carat sizes, this is a primary segment for the US market. In one to four carat sizes, the overall value and carats have grown by 45% in 2022, the full year. So prices peaked, prices kept falling after that in, uh, since March, but inventory kept increasing. Now this, is, this could be due to various reasons. Uh, part of it is a lot of people might have stocked up more inventory uh, of rough 
uh, when prices were increasing because they found that th there was a momentum. Maybe miners uh, got rid of a lot of their inventory when prices were still high so that they could get decent prices for them. So there's various reasons why this could have happened. Uh, but overall, uh, the pipeline increased dramatically. You know, 45% increase in, in supply. The demand has not increased that much. Uh, you know, at, at best, demand has increased 12%. So a lot of the decline in prices is because of the supply. If you look at the overall size distribution of uh, B2B natural lamb inventory by value since 2021, we see that that one to four carat uh, segment has increased uh, much more uh, compared to 2021. So that, that increase has been there. Uh, in 2023 so far, inventory has come down 15% overall in value and 9% in care terms. So uh, in value terms, inventory has come down by more because the prices have declined significantly, but in care terms, that decline has just been 9%. In more significant, the one to four carat range though, the carat inventory has only come down by two to 3% throughout the year, uh, 2023 so far. Uh, despite decreasing new production, and de new production has decreased, by the way. So, uh, you know, if you look at the statistics, GIA had to cut off uh, 151 workers because less stones were being submitted for certification. That is the uh, an evidence that new production, new uh, supply is coming down. But the pipeline had expanded too quickly in 2022. But 45%, that's a dramatic number uh, to begin with. So the pipeline had expanded too quickly and it's just taking time to recover. And that is putting a lot of pressure on the prices. The next thing I would like to bring to your attention, so this is a B2B sales chart. Previously it was inventory and how that proportionally has changed throughout the year. This is a chart of the B2B national diamond sales by value. So if you look again, compared to 2021, uh, in 2023, mid 2023, uh, the red and green segments have increased again uh, proportionally. So in early 2021, one to four carat stones accounted for approximately 57% of all certified stones sold. By mid 2023, this had grown to 66%. So this came at the expense of DOS shares by and large. With competition from larger lab grown diamonds and a more sluggish China, so China has been sluggish, um, DOS shares have been the most affected. And in fact, by and large, we're seeing that maybe Lagrone has not cannibalized natural diamond industry, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't cause the consumer preferences to change and evolve. You know, with growing Lagrone popularity, even consumers who are natural diamond consumers, they want different things. They are looking to differentiate. So uh, here's a movement, in, uh, a movement chart uh, from the Dietech Analytics app. Again, you can uh, look at a more detailed map um, on the app or on the analytics.diatech.ai website, so you can scan the QR code there. On average, we're seeing that better colors and clarities see faster movements. You know, the lower color, lower clarity goods, so JKLM or SI and I goods, the PK goods, are the worst hit. They're also seeing excessive memo returns as, you know, that lower color, lower clarity goods have been replaced, uh, you know, the shelf space has been replaced by lab grown diamonds. And that makes sense. You know, if you're, uh, uh, if you're a natural diamond consumer who's going to buy a heavily included diamond, um, that means you are not able to afford uh, a, a, a really beautiful natural diamond at the end of the day. That means that you, know, you, you might be more likely to buy a larger or better looking or, more, uh, or less included uh, uh, labrador diamond instead uh, for way cheaper. So I think that has changed the consumer mindset, especially for uh, you know, lower sizes, as well as lower colors and lower clarities. So there's a similar movement in prices. You know, if you see the IFV BS goods, the prices have dropped by about 5% over the last month. BS goods have gone down by around 7% in the same time. And SI goods have gone down by a whopping 13%. So lower clarity goods are declining faster in uh, prices also. So part of it has been, you know, like I said, there's been a lot of return of memo goods uh, that limited shelf space uh, for lower color clarity stones gets replaced by Labron diamonds. Uh, these stones come back to the pipeline. And again, they put heavier pressure on the prices because suddenly, you know, those were considered more or less sold. Part of that is always going to get sold uh, year on year. Uh, that was considered for all uh, practical purposes, uh, you know, taken care of. And uh, now all of that inventory finds its way back to the market uh, and, and causes a lot of pressure on the prices again. 
all of that said and done, uh, natural diamond is a self-regulating industry. You know, with sustained pressure on lower colors and clarities and smaller sizes, some mines who have those goods as the primary articles or as the more uh, characteristic articles will shut down. Uh, so this will overall reduce that supply and stabilize the prices in the long run because the mines will just not be feasible um, as the rough prices also for those colors and clarities keep declining. Okay, but by and large, there are also other economic factors at play. Uh, rising interest rates have prompted the entire industry to deleverage. So if you just look at the example of Signet, um, during the pandemic, it had an overall debt to equity ratio of 86.9%. Now it's just 6.5%. So they've significantly decreased their debt to equity ratio since the last three, four years. Uh, you know, and, and that's not just at the retail level. If you look at the entire B2B pipeline, uh, since 2019, the bank debt has gone down by over 26%. So deleveraging ultimately for manufacturers, for traders, uh, it implies that they're going to reduce inventory. Uh, it means selling inventory off at lower prices to pay off the debt that they've taken on. So Signet, for example, also, so again, this, this not just affects the manufacturers and traders, but all the way up to retailers, Signet has reduced its inventory holdings by almost 13% since 2020. And since before the pandemic, compared to pre-pandemic levels, its inventory holdings are down by 20%. So, you know, there's various factors for this deleveraging interest rates increasing way too quickly, way too fast, uh, you know, have shocked the industry. Uh, across the world, uh, uh, companies have a pressure to get rid of as much debt as possible, uh, even if it means uh, to sell off inventory at lower prices. So that has been one. Uh, banks have been more and more reluctant to lend to the diamond industry, especially in, in a few markets. Um, and so again, that has put a lot of pressure uh, on uh, kind of the pipeline because that inventory, um, people are less likely to want to hold their inventory and weather their storm. They, they have to get rid of it. Uh, and that means there's more people, uh, more desperate to sell. Uh, and again, that is putting a lot of pressure on the prices. So for retailers, you know, deleveraging might also include uh, leases and real estate, uh, because again, those are liabilities and uh, sort of long-term liabilities uh, that they hold. And uh, as interest rates increase, um, all of that is going to also become more expensive. Uh, so just as an example, uh, again, looking at Signet, uh, between Jan and June 2023, uh, in the first six months of this year, Signet closed a net total of 47 stores. Now, Signet has thousands of stores, so proportionally, maybe this is 2% of their stores. But what this means is that, you know, people were going to buy, if we're looking at demand, that's more or less stable. But they, they'll buy at an online store or another store. At the end of the day, you know, people will find other ways to buy. But what this does mean is that physical inventory uh, requirement at Signet is going to go lower. So retailers will need to hold physically less inventory and so more of those goods that were previously held uh, at these retailers are now going to be left in the midstream. So all this is not to say that uh, you know uh, this sudden decline and the dramatic decline in prices was natural or it was expected. Uh, you know it it's not to say that uh, this is the natural course of events, it's not. In fact when combining with many other economic signals to see the net correlation with diamond prices we're seeing that, especially since June 2023, the recent decline has been drastic. Uh, so if you look at this chart, you know, we uh, have, a, have a feature on the app to auto fit multiple economic signals against the diamond index. Uh, so we, we took a lot of the import indicators like inflation, import index, uh, jewelry consumption, S&P 500, gold. If you look at all of this, for the most part, they've followed each other uh, for the last many years. But since June, the, the prices have declined almost comically. Uh, if you look at that decline, that has been so dramatic and so stark that the overall economy hasn't gone down by that much. Overall factors of the economy haven't corrected by that much. So this is, uh, by all measures, an overcorrection. And even if we include all of the charts, you know, more and more indicators we add, the better and better and closer and closer the overall correlation is going to be. If you still look at, you know, after adding all of this, we're still below what the economy is going to be, what the economy is at. 
Uh, so what all this goes to show is that given the overall state of the economy, the natural diamond prices are significantly lower. We're undervalued, uh, oversold. So, you know, overall, we're about 10% below the expected value of the index, uh, given overall economic conditions. But even with a conservative estimate, even if you include all of the available signals, we're at least 5% below value. So I think ultimately what it has all come down to is sentiment. We, we, cannot, we simply cannot underestimate the effect of sentiment. The negative environment uh, partly is because of labor and diamonds, partly because prices fell too quickly and people lost confidence. Um, there, there's been various factors which have led to a lot of negativity. Uh, and I think when people are that negative, that kind of hampers the confidence in the midstream. So for example, traders who typically would finance the industry, uh, you know, the, the business model is simply buy low, sell high. Even when prices are so low, they're reluctant to buy and hold stock because they're worried that prices will fall further. They don't have the confidence because the overall environment in the industry is so negative, right? Uh, so if you look at the sentiment index, uh, we look at a lot of news articles related to the diamond industry. And based on that, based on how positive or negative they are, we classify the overall sentiment of the industry at that time. If you look at the sentiment index, especially uh, in the last uh, few months, that sentiment has dropped dramatically. Uh, you know, we're, we're very, very negative as an industry. And that's obviously affecting uh, overall midstream consumption, uh, who's holding the stock, how much, uh, that deleveraging movement it has sped up. Uh, so it, all of these reasons are a huge uh, kind of uh, factor in the declining prices, right? Uh, so I think, again, we have a lot of takeaways from uh, this data. Firstly, uh, the data does suggest that prices have overcorrected. Some of it are economic factors, some of it are sentimental factors. Um, and lab-grown diamonds might not have cut demand overall, but it has certainly led to a shift in consumer preferences, especially you know, PK goods, smaller sizes. All of these have been more dramatically affected uh, than uh, some of the other segments. Uh, a big factor of the current slowdown uh, is due to an overall deleveraging uh, movement. Uh, part of it is bank reluctance, part of it is increasing interest rates. All of this is just leading uh, you know, to smaller inventory levels hailed by traders, jewelers, kind of the whole midstream to downstream uh, use cases. Uh, overall, uh, you know, uh, the price decline has been a lot more of a supply story than a demand story. Uh, there was a huge spike in supply in 2022. Uh, and, uh, you know, that sudden change in sentiment after that prices uh, started falling, uh, it, it shake, uh, has shaken the industry. Uh, the higher inventory levels in the pipeline have had a very strong impact on prices, despite demand not decreasing by that much or increasing, uh, you know, ever so slightly even. Okay, so let's look at the overall recap. Like what, what were the key takeaways? I think, uh, you know, we started with looking at the overall demand and we saw that March 2022 was, by all measures, a very transient period. It had very high money supply. Inflation was lagging, so it hadn't caught up yet. Uh, and therefore, March 2022 is simply not a good benchmark. Uh, so if you look at consumption figures, units sold, any of that, it's just simply not a very good metric. Uh, even revenue of retailers, that's not a very good metric to compare it to, uh, especially if you're uh, looking at specifically though that those six months where prices were all time high. If you look at largely the, the revenue of big retailers, uh, it's up compared to pre-pandemic levels, despite all the economic uh, factors. Uh, so I think that's, again, uh, a sign of hope for the industry where uh, the consumer preferences haven't dramatically uh, shifted or, you know, the, we're not in that negative of a recession just yet. Uh, while lab-grown diamond uh, prices uh, have declined, it has affected some product categories way more and some audience segments were more likely to shift. Uh, it has dramatically affected them. Uh, but if you look at the industry overall, there is uh, less evidence to suggest cannibalization. Uh, we look at branding uh, and overall the natural diamond story will be critical, uh, especially as lab-grown diamond prices fall. Uh, the diamond industry will need to differentiate between the products, um, but we do see some efforts along those lines. Um, natural diamond, uh, you know, again, uh, seems to have a strong story and appeal to H&Is. 
Uh, whereas lab grown has more of an accessibility story. Uh, and I think uh, the data suggests that both can coexist, especially as long term sustainability for lab grown diamonds may be more in fashion, while jewelers will not be able to sustain lab grown diamonds as much. So they'll likely shift more uh, towards natural diamonds again in the long run. Natural diamond prices have overcorrected due to various reasons. Uh, but now, if you're looking at overall economic conditions, uh, you know, the US uh, looked like it was going into a recession, but now people are talking more and more of a soft landing. Um, and so as uh, you know, the econ economic uh, conditions are improving, natural diamond prices have significantly overcorrected. And so we do expect uh, in the next few months uh, for there to be an uptick again. Economic conditions also have led to deleveraging, uh, like we said, uh, which has sh shrunk the industry, uh, the inventory held in the midstream of the industry. Uh, and uh, that has put a lot of pressure on the prices, along with a very sudden and uh, stark incre increase in supply uh, in 2022. Uh, like we said, again, in some categories, that increase was 45%. And so it is just taking some time to recover, despite uh, the demand being decent. Uh, and so again, uh, that is one factor of prices and it, 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 it should be reassuring to think that it, it's not demand uh, and more so it's the supply because uh, supply, especially with uh, the GJPC recently announcing the ban on rough imports for a couple of months, uh, the supply should get back in control uh, and that should ideally revive uh, the sentiment. Okay. So all this goes to show, uh, again, we're, we're not, we cannot see the future. Uh, we've just tried to best present and interpret available data. Uh, and the data is available for free on our app or website. So uh, you can also uh, see the data for yourself and make uh, whatever judgments you seem fit. Uh, but all this goes to show, I think, is that it is a bad time for the industry. It is a difficult time, uh, but the fundamentals of the industry uh, don't seem to have changed uh, as many people worry. Uh, the fundamentals of the industry are the same, they're strong. Uh, the lab grown diamonds or the demand or economic factors have not fundamentally changed how the industry works. Uh, it needs to evolve, uh, it needs to adapt, especially in uh, certain segments like PGA goods or lower uh, sizes and colors and clarities. But by and large, uh, the fundamentals uh, seem to be strong. Um, so if this was a live webinar, we would have taken some questions, uh, but I, I would just end it at that. Uh, thank you very much for uh, listening. And if you do have any questions or comments, feel free to reach uh, out to me at my email uh, up here or WhatsApp me on the phone number here. Or you can always you know, leave them in the comments below uh, and uh, we would try to get to, uh, to all of them as soon as possible. Hopefully uh, th this uh, gave you some insight and uh, Hopefully, I think what we're really trying to achieve is that negativity uh, and the ne negative sentiment, uh, as we see with the data, has been a huge factor uh, of uh, declining prices. But uh, the, the data doesn't suggest that. I think the fundamentals are strong. Uh, and as an industry, we just need to uh, kind of uh, buckle up and uh, uh, get, get out of this slump together. Uh, all right, uh, thank you uh, for watching.